Becky Burr, who was formerly with NTIA, now an ICANN board member. Becky, thank you for, for taking the time to talk to us. If Vince Cerf is considered the father of the Internet, I've heard you refer to as the mother of the Internet, what was it like in those early years working with Ira Magaziner to get ICANN going? So, first of all, I have been called the godmother of, D of ICANN, but I'm not going to take credit for the Internet. Um, the early years were uh, very exciting um, in, in, a, in the following way. There was a, a problem um, funding for uh, both the funding for the uh, IANA functions had uh, been stopped by the National Science Foundation. There was need to sort of s secure a, a firm foundation on which to continue the DNS work. Um, uh, there was, you know, talk about moving it into a more uh, inter international organization kind of uh, UN agency, and a lot of people were very concerned about it, and a lot of people were very concerned about it from many, many different focuses from the keeping the internet, the internet being able to continue to move at, uh, at, at internet speed, not having a heavy governmental overlay, allowing the sort of creativity that comes from private sector writ large uh, management. And so um, in order to uh, figure out what to do, um, we conducted a, a very extensive sort of talking uh, couple of months where dozens and dozens, hundreds of people uh, came in and uh, talked to us about what it was they needed to see going forward, what their problems with the way things were running then. There was a lot of uh, uh, disputes, trademark disputes, other kinds of disputes that had been kind of building up. Mm -hmm. um, and so we got an enormous amount of input from speaking with people, and this was uh, around the world, so it wasn't just uh, the U.S. And then we sort of crafted the green paper, which we wanted to throw out there and see what, what's coming back at us. Um, we uh, sort of put it out there, and we got thousands of comments, and thousands of comments, they were online comments, uh, from around the world, which was, I think, in, this was 1997, it was probably a first in terms of online mm -hmm. comments globally from, a, from the U.S. government perspective. Uh, so then we did more talking, uh, more talking around the world, more talking with people, and uh, produced the, the white paper. There was a huge amount of excitement uh, about it. There was, a, there was a, an enormous amount of energy. Was there uh, trepidation as well? Um, well, of course, there were some people that uh, were saying that it wasn't going to work or that it should be it should be managed by the ITU. But in fact, it was a pretty small number. There was, there was very strong global consensus for um, allowing this to move into a non-government, governmental setting. And in fact, it was really trying to replicate or, or preserve as much of what had been going on because while DARPA had been funding, the work that uh, that John did, it was with a very light touch, and he was really running it. So, so there was. It sounds like there was pretty much universal acceptance that the DNS management of the DNS w w would at least go toward a private uh, model instead of a government model. Right? Yes, uh, yes, there was, and just to put this in context, that was a time in which uh, there was enormous amount of. Uh, optimism and awareness about what the internet was doing. Um, the U.S. government produced a paper on a framework for global internet commerce mm -hmm. that called for a very light regulatory touch. Uh, the European Union produced one. There was one produced by Japan, and, uh, and there were uh, big international conferences that where people were very focused on uh, not imposing a heavy governmental regulatory regime on the internet. And there was a little bit of a sense of, you know, what if everyone did? So, mm -hmm. you know, if you pass a regulation. So ICANN grew up in the midst of a very vibrant uh, global discussion about allowing the internet to be the internet, 
um, and uh, sort of light-handed regulatory approach to it. So, uh, you know, some of the things that we've seen in more recent years were, were really not there. Well, the, the whole the whole concept, ICANN is such a, an unusual beast in this, this sort of bottom-up policy formation system uh, with multiple inputs, unlike traditional organizations where it goes from the top down. Where did that come from? Uh, it came from the, the uh, what we were saying was the whole notion all along was uh, private sector leadership. Now, today we wouldn't call that, we wouldn't say private sector leadership, we would say multi-stakeholder. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't mean just business mm -hmm. or anything like that, but p stakeholders who, who were part of it uh, would be involved. Um, that had always been the case. John uh, Postel worked very closely with the ITF and with the CCNSO managers and the like. There was a need uh, in that transition to expand the definition of stakeholder. There were more stakeholders. Uh, there were end users. There were business uh, users of the internet. The, the, the pot was getting bigger. The stakeholder uh, group was getting bigger. But what, what we wanted to do was really preserve what, had, what was going on and what had traditionally been the basis of, uh, of DNS management, which is sort of uh, consensus among the stakeholders, but recognize that the group of stakeholders had gotten much bigger and much more diverse and much more global. Help me understand the time frame. Were you at NTIA then? Uh, I moved to NTIA on June 1st of 1997, and we published the first uh, request for comments on June 2nd or something like that. What was it like working with Magaziner on this endeavor? So Ira was great. Um, he had a group of people from all, all over the U.S. government uh, working on the framework for global electronic commerce, and um, I was working on privacy and internet governance. Uh, there were people from the uh, U.S. Trade Rep talking about uh, tariffs. Um, there were people from all over the government putting together the sort of if we want to if we want to uh, enable um, us to take advantage of the uh, ex the opportunity that the internet uh, represented from an economic growth perspective. What would we need? What structure would we need to have in place? And so. This, this DNS management piece came directly out of the, the uh, e-commerce. Um. To, to that point, Magaziner told us, he said, you know, when he finished with the failed uh, Clinton health care initiative and he was going into this, he said a primary driver of this was we wanted a long-term economic growth model. Was the economic viability of the Internet recognized by everybody at those very early stages? Uh, we were talking about uh, what percentage of the global economy was already be sort of riding on the internet and how that would grow over time. So uh, there was a clear recognition that the internet um, was the growth engine mm -hmm. um, of the future and that we needed to get it right. People got to, it. Yeah, but people definitely got it. Now, some, I think actually uh, our numbers were probably quite low um, in terms of what we thought would be happening five years down the road. Uh, but, but, but globally, people understood that this was a, uh, a, a paradigm shift like the Industrial mm -hmm. Revolution in a, in a way. W was there a across the board acceptance in, uh, 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 throughout the U.S. government in the other agencies or was there, did you have to argue this sort of, um, for lack of a better phrase, we built it, we sort of own it attitude? Uh, there was remarkably little of that in, really? in the administration. Certainly the science agencies that had been part of it um, uh, never had that attitude. I mean, they had gone global, although in a you know, university and, and uh, research institute model. Um, there was, uh, interestingly enough, there was a little more resistance to sort of commercialization. But, uh, you know, you heard it once in a while, but 
not uh, uh, not at all um, the executive order that President Clinton signed included um, uh, moving this into uh, out of the government into the private sector. Uh, so, you know, every once in a while you hear it. But yeah. how about Capitol Hill? Was there acceptance there? Well, there was. Um, first of all, uh, it's pretty complex, and what we were proposing to do was pretty uh, unique. Mm -hmm. um, we couldn't point precisely to a model of what we were what we were doing because we were we were building something. Um, some people on uh, the Hill understood that. Um, uh, there were, of course, some economic uh, uh, issues that created some lobbying on Capitol Hill. Um, we were changing. Uh, we, we were changing the competitive landscape in a pretty fundamental way, and um, the the current winners in the uh, economic landscape of the DNS were resisted a little bit, and they had some got some traction on on Capitol Hill. So we had uh, you know a series of hearings and a series of investigations to make sure that we were doing it right. Uh, what was the reaction? Uh, Throughout ICANN's history, there have always been congressional hearings about some aspect, whether it was the new GTLD program, whether it was the IANA stewardship transition. What was the reaction both uh, within the administration, multiple administrations, I guess, and globally for ICANN being called up to the legislative branch and being asked to explain this or that? Well, so frankly, I think, um, it's not clear, uh, but for the change in Verisign's position in this, um, that it's not clear to me how much uh, Capitol Hill interest there would have been. I think that honestly generated the. You interest. think that drove it? Uh, I think that uh, it. I think that there were. I know that there were concerted efforts to get Congress interested in this. Now, that's fair game. It, I just want to make sure people do it all the time. But I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. So you're saying Verisign drove that interest. Yeah. Um, and and that happens all the time. Uh, and you would expect you know, a publicly traded company uh, com who that has an obligation to maximize shareholder value would take the steps that it could um, to retain its position. Had there not been that lobbying push, there would not have been as great an interest as there was? There would not have been as great an interest. Mm -hmm. There would have been, there clearly would have been interest from the, from the science committees. There, you know, the, the Commerce Committee would have looked at it. They would, but we also had uh, the uh, Judiciary Committees looking at it from a trademark and mm -hmm. Uh, perspective, an IP perspective. So um, there were enough issues uh, going on that I think that there would have been some hearings. I suspect that they would not have been quite as hostile. Um, but uh, but we did have a Democratic administration and a, a Republican uh, Congress at that mm -hmm. time. So there would have been some uh, of the natural um, partisan politics. Whenever ICANN was called up to the Hill, it always appeared to me that it was never truly understood, that whenever there was a hearing, even right up to, to, to the end, when, when the, the final cruise hearing on the transition, there was a sort of underlying current that a lot of members just didn't quite get ICANN. Well, I think that's right. It's a, it, they didn't get the DNS, right? So you have to understand the DNS to begin with, and then you have to understand how the how the disper management is dispersed, and how um, there really isn't a kind of central other than the coordination role that that ICANN plays. Um, it's not a it's not a single monolith. It's not a thing. It's mm -hmm. a it's a you know vast network of networks with. Uh, you know, managed by the DNS system or, or navigated by the DNS system. Um, it, it, that's a, that is, it, it's complicated. We've gotten better about explaining it. The other thing is that to the extent there was a we built it, we own it, that was based on this fundamental misunderstanding about what it meant to, to be the authoritative route, right? Mm -hmm. And John 
tried to demonstrate that one night by directing the root server system to point to another authoritative root. That was a uh, that that could have been for for those of us who understood what he was doing. It was clearly John saying, "You guys are just confused. Here's how it works." Um, it wasn't John pushing back about the government. It was John trying no, to. No, well, I've heard I, both. I no, I do not. Th I think it was a, a moment in which John was trying to demonstrate that the that some of the arguments were quite silly mm -hmm. um, and uh, taking the opportunity to, in a, in a very tangible way, demonstrate what, what, where control lay and how control could move um, from place to place. Now, uh, that's the way I was interpreted. There, there were multiple administrations, the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, and so on. Did, was there, uh, could you ascertain a difference in the way that ICANN was handled or dealt with from administration to administration? Was there a difference? So, um, you know, the Clinton administration uh, ended in uh, 2000 mm -hmm. and um, uh, and it was that it was still really in its infancy. Um, we clearly had the uh, commitment to uh, complete the transition and move it forward. Um, I think that that could have been um, that might have been uh, the way subsequent administrations would have proceeded. Um, it took I can a while to get sort of stable and we had the 2003-2004 Evolution and Reform Committee. But what really changed things was September 11th. Um, at, at that moment, there was a sort of where are all of the potential uh, control safety kinds of uh, places. And I think that for a while, the intelligence community was pretty uh, convinced that there was an important uh, reason to control the authoritative route. Um, that changed by the end of the Bush administration, and they had they they had they had sort of worked through the evaluation and understood the system had gotten much more robust and much mm -hmm. more dispersed and all of those things. Um, and so, uh, while there was always this this commitment to transfer. Ultimately, it happened that there was a, um, a period of time where there was increasing anxiety about what it, what would happen if if we didn't have this sort of backstop control uh, over the route. And I can was it, it was hard work to mm -hmm. to to sort of get to a stable period. So that kind of supported uh, allowing the time this time to pass. But by the end of the Bush administration. Um, it was pretty clear that the uh, th that that people had understood that this wasn't uh, a sort of national security tool, um, and that and so that uh, that paved the way in the Obama administration for finishing the transition. Let me ask you about another issue, and you were involved in this one, which was dot triple X. Was this a case because it's often pointed to as this is a case where the government did try to influence ICANN. So um, we did do FOIAs and and we, uh, I don't think that there's anything in the written record that uh, that proves that the U.S. government intervened. Um, I had conversations with people uh, uh, who were directly in that line. The U.S. government did intervene in the triple X decision. Um, and it was sort of after the fact because we had been working very closely with NTIA to make sure they understood what what the what the TLD was about, what was going on. It was all fine until after ICANN board had actually already approved it. And at that moment there was a, a political a, a very strong political pushback, somebody reaching 
uh, conservative organization reaching uh, back into the Bush administration at the highest level, which resulted in really a sea change from NTIA's perspective. How would you characterize, I asked Vince Cerf this question, I said, how would you characterize historically the USG's relationship with ICANN? And he said, problematic and not very supportive. How would you characterize it? Well, uh, I think that there was, uh, there was support uh, initially. There was a great deal of frustration um, uh, from, uh, on the part of NTIA in the early years. Uh, the IANA functions were not delivered in the best way. They were not, they, there were delays, it took a long time. They got lots and lots and lots of complaints from the direct consumers um, that just serving the IANA functions uh, was difficult. Um, there were some kind of heavy-handed moves to try to get uh, country code, top-level domains, to, to enter into contracts that were well-intended but um, seriously uh, backfired. And, and so there was a great deal of, an, of, uh, of uh, frustration in the early days with performance um, and sort of heavy-handed tactics. Uh, and I think that the government pushed back on that. And then after that, um, until, uh, until Larry Strickling uh, sort of got uh, fully up to speed about it, I, I would imagine it uh, could have been difficult. I, I'm, I think that uh, Larry uh, was fully supportive of ICANN throughout, um, but I think uh, there was probably frustration on both sides right up to the end. Did you think the transition was going to fly? Um, I was really happy <laughs> on October on October first. I just have to say, I think it was touch and go. Until but between the, the announcement on the in, in 2014 and when it when it finally. Uh, happened in October of 2016. Did you was there were there points where you're going? Uh, I don't think this is going to work. Well, I think that until uh, the community the community came together right after the announcement, mm -hmm. um, in which the announcement was really focused on the IANA functions technical uh, transition, um, and the community stood up and said in a, a kind of astonishing unity that never before seen. That's not good enough. We need these accountability fixes. Um, this is the moment to do this. And ICANN resisted. Uh, and frankly, so did NTIA. Didn't really understand why we needed this. Um, and we, so we did uh, both comp complicate the, the transition process by demanding a more uh, robust uh, review and, and change to get there. And I, I was very worried about it until ICANN finally acknowledged the community's views on this and, and worked to put together the um, CCWG on the Cross Community Working Group on Accountability. Uh, after that, I felt pretty good about it. There were, you know, moments in between uh, now and then, and it, was, and it obviously took a lot longer than anybody had hoped that it would. But you have had a unique perspective in that you were at NTIA, you were an attorney involved in the dot triple X case, and now you're an ICANN board member. So you've been along the entire continuum. Well, so actually, it's a little more uh, a little more complicated than that. I was at NTIA, but I was also the GAC representative from the United States to to the GAC for the first couple of years. And then I was a lawyer in private practice, but I was also on the Country Code Name Supporting Organization Council for many years. Um, so uh, I, I have had a, a kind of nice so, look So across. my question, given that broad range of experience, how has that shaped your perception of ICANN? Um, well, I think I have a pretty good view of sort of what, what the drivers are across the um, or organization. I think I understand and, uh, uh, and share the concerns, have a, have a sort of, a, I, I have many, many different perspectives I can look at it and say, as a country code uh, manager, 
you know, here are the issues at stake. As a business uh, participant, as an industry uh, participant in the DNS industry, here are the concerns. As a government, here are the concerns. Um, and as a, you know, member of the board, here are the concerns. You uh, put them together and, and figure it out. Great. Becky Burr, thank you very much. Appreciate Certainly. you taking the time to talk to us. It's a pleasure.